Welcome to episode three of module eight, non-infectious diseases and disorders. This is our last episode on inquiry question one, looking at organisms internal environment and how it's maintained in response to a changing external environment. Our syllabus reference for this episode is looking at the trends and patterns in behavioral, structural and physiological adaptations in endotherms that assist in maintaining homeostasis and mechanisms in plants that allow water balance to be maintained. Our learning intentions, we will call the, the terms structural, behavioral and physiological adaptations, outline examples of endotherms and their adaptations that assist them to maintain homeostasis, and lastly, outline adaptations in plants to maintain water balance. So definition to start us off with, an endotherm is an animal that generates and controls its internal heat so that its body core temperature can be regulated at a level different to the ambient temperature. So what that means is that animals such as um, mammals are considered to be endotherms. On the other end, ectotherms are considered to be animals that cannot regulate their body temperature, for example, amphibians and reptiles. So let's revisit structural adaptations. So a structural adaptation refers to the physical features of an organism that enable them to survive in their environment. So the Spinifex hopping mouse is a nocturnal desert mammal that lives in the sandy country of Central Australia. They have large rounded ears that have a large surface area that the blood flows through and then returns to cool them, cool them down. The fairy penguin, also known as a little penguin, lives in the cooler climates in South Australia and in New Zealand. Like all penguins, their round body contains a layer of blubber, which is thick fat that helps to keep them warm in cold water. The red kangaroo are the largest species of kangaroo that can be found in arid grasslands, shrublands, and as well as desert and open savanna woodlands. They have a lot of blood vessels under their forearms and their pores, and this encourages heat loss via convection to keep their core body temperature within a narrow range, despite the hot ambient surroundings. Let's look at behavioural adaptations. So behavioural adaptations are an action that an organism will carry out to increase their chances of survival and reproduction. The Spinifex hopping mouse, being nocturnal, will burrow underground and sleep in that burrow during the day to escape the heat. To avoid overheating, the fairy penguins are able to move into the cool or cold waters to lower their core body temperature or seek shade under rocks. The penguins also hug each other to minimise each penguin's surface area exposure to the cold environment. The red kangaroo is also nocturnal and during the hottest parts of the day, they will seek shade and sleep to escape the heat. And lastly, physiological adaptations. Physiological adaptations refer to the metabolic or the physiologic adjustment within the cell or tissues of an organism in response to an external stimulus. The Spinifex hopping mouse has evolved a unique feature to conserve water so that they can continue to thrive in Australia's harsh desert climates. This particular species of hopping mouse is said to have the most efficient tiny kidneys, which allow them to produce the most concentrated urine of any mammal ever recorded. Fairy penguins are able to thermoregulate their core body temperature as their muscle glands are activated, resulting in involuntary shivering to produce heat energy. Panting is performed by the red kangaroo, whereby heat energy is lost through ventilation. The process of panting allows water on the tongue and the mouth surface to be evaporated as the blood underneath these surfaces are able to be transferred to the cooler water via the conduction. Let's move into osmoregulation. Osmoregulation refers to the maintenance of constant osmotic, this is water diffusion pressure, in the fluids of an organism by the control of water and cell concentrations. The eucalyptus is a native Australian plant that is also commonly known as the gum tree or stringy bark. In the summer when it's dry and hot, they will drop their leaves. This effectively minimises the total surface area in which the tree is exposed to the ambient environment so that less heat is absorbed. By minimising the heat that is absorbed, the rate of transpiration is lowered and therefore leaf fall mechanism by the eucalyptus tree reduces its risk of dehydration. The eucalyptus tree 
has its leaves hanging in a vertical position. So it reduces the surface area in which it's exposed to the sun's zenith. By reducing its exposure at, to the hottest parts of the day, it reduces the risk again of dehydration. The eucalyptus tree is able to control the time at which its stomata are opened and closed. During early morning and late afternoon where the ambient temperature is cool and the sunlight is less intense, it's, a, it, it's able to open its stomata to obtain carbon dioxide necessary for photosynthesis to occur. This controlled manner of stomata opening and closing at the most suitable time allows the plant again to avoid dehydration. Eucalyptus and as well as banksia plants have really thick cuticles that insulates water from excessive sunlight as it reduces the internal temperature. By doing so, the thick cuticle reduces the rate of evaporation. We have previously looked at the mangrove when we did our Hunter Wetlands excursion back in term one this year. So I thought it would be a, another really great example. So mangroves are a group of trees and shrubs that grow in our coastal saline water or brackish water. They have what they call pneumatophores that are specialised roots that act like snorkels when they're partially flooded and have pores called lenticels that cover their surface area where oxygen exchange occurs. The lenticels contain substances that are hydrophobic, meaning that they hate water. So when they're submerged, the water cannot flood into the roots. The plant also creates a barrier and can almost completely exclude the salt from entering their vascular system. Over 90% of the salt from seawater is excluded. This barrier acts against osmosis, a process where water moves in from areas of low concentration in salt, sugar concentration, to areas in high salt, or what we've learned as sugar. If the mangrove didn't have such a barrier, the salty ocean would suck the mangrove dry. And that is the end of episode three. Thank you for watching.